This episode is going to showcase multiple eyewitness accounts in the state of Tennessee. And all of these accounts have to deal with the strange, the supernatural, and things that we can't even begin to comprehend that are clearly existing in the woods and wilderness of Tennessee. So strap your seatbelt in, folks, because I'm about to show you just how hairy Tennessee actually is. On the afternoon of August 12th, just a few years back, probably around 2018 or so, an unidentified creature was spotted by an anonymous female hunter in the woodlands of Tennessee. Now, Tennessee is often known for its small game hunting like possums and squirrels, at least to some, but this hunter, she was armed with her trusty side-by-side -side shotgun. It was a source of comfort for her rather than fear around this entity. She went on to describe that the creature she encountered bore a disturbing resemblance to what she would refer to as a distorted wild dog with having very specific and discernible features that were undoubtedly canine, even more so under the daylight. This female hunter who was hiking around in the woods of Tennessee describes unusually sharp ears and an unnatural level of intelligence emanating from what she had encountered and even went on to describe just its overall abnormal appearance. She had described its strangely elongated head, a very odd shaggy hairstyle all around its snout and very large fangs. But before she had encountered such a thing, she kept hearing this strange, persistent noise that reminded her of a coughing sound. It's very interesting because in all the stories I've ever heard or read, I've never heard about that, but you just never know. Now, she claimed that up until the actual encounter, these sounds grew louder and louder and crescendoed until it made itself visible to her. It was actually as she was going into a clearing that she spotted this thing starting to come out of the trees and that's when her and it locked eyes for the first time and she described its expression being one of oh crap you caught me uh now i need an escape and kind of hastily moved back into the dense thicket she described the overall demeanor being shocked and surprised at her presence and that she believes she caught it doing something it shouldn't, or at least that's how she described it. She then described that after the initial sighting took place, she had looped her way around this clearing onto another trail nearby that was roughly a mile and a half away, actually up a pretty steep incline, she described, when she noticed that the air around her seemed to suddenly change, and within seconds, several of these wolf-like beings that she had just encountered not even two hours prior had now fully surrounded her, hence the thumbnail, which is actually supposed to be a recreation of this exact moment. Now, being up close, she described them more akin to that of a hyena, except much more distorted and ugly looking, but had very distinct human characteristics, most notably in their eyes and the expression and the overall intelligence these things possessed. Immediately, she knew that she was no match for whatever these animals were and just laid down her shotgun and just stood there because she knew that these things were so close, so large, and so powerful, one measly shot isn't going to take out any of them and they would have pounced and devoured her right there on the spot. So she sets her shotgun down, she just stands up and stays as calm and quiet as she can and they're just walking around her, pacing, smelling her, kind of giving her scornful look and expressions. She also described having chewing tobacco in her right hand and that she believes these things could smell it and that they didn't like the smell. And after maybe 20 or 30 seconds of this going on, they just decide to leave her there and they take off, leaving her completely by herself. It was at this point she took the prime opportunity and got out of there as fast as she could. Now, she never gave any of us a specific location on where it was, but I believe it sounds like she was somewhere outside of Nashville. In fact, much of her family has had very similar encounters with what they describe as wolfmen all over Tennessee and specifically Kentucky. Now, I'm not going to get into any of the Kentucky encounters because, well, this episode's about Tennessee. But I will say this just on a personal note, that going from the Pacific Northwest down into Tennessee, the forestry difference is astounding. You see, in the Pacific Northwest, the woods are what I like to call Bigfoot woods. 
Now, if you look at pictures online, it's very much pine forest and fir trees and the woods are kind of spread apart. You could walk through it, you could look around, but when you get to the wilderness around Tennessee in the south, everything is just so thick and green and just piled together. I have no idea how people even got out here in the first place without macheting their way into things. And if the woods like that are so dense and thick, well, you can only imagine how many things can use that to their advantage to hide, which brings us into the next story. On the afternoon of July 12th, 2019, there was an avid hiker who's exploring Abrams Falls Trail in Tennessee when he too, just like the last eyewitness, came across an unusual wolf-like creature. Now, this person distinctly remarked on its very odd behavior, a complete lack of fear and responsiveness to any stimuli that normal wild animals would clearly react to. He had taken a couple of days off work at this point and had decided to venture off some familiar trails that he had already been down multiple times. And so he prepared his kit comprised of water, a small backpack that contained a standard first aid kit and a first aid kit and some survival bars, survival bars. I call them survival bars. You guys might call them energy bars, snack bars, whatever. Now positioned roughly midway to the base of Abrams Falls trailhead, this man was unexpectedly confronted by an imposing canine like being that just kind of casually squandered onto the trail trail, blocking his passage. Immediately, it became apparent to the man that this was no usual animal and was far larger than any regular wolf or coyote that he had ever seen in his life. Just like the last eyewitness, as this thing made its way out onto the trail, it looked over at him and just observed him, shocked to see him, just as shocked as he was to see it. And he then describes that he actually tried to communicate with this thing by talking to it, by yelling at it, but it remained indifferent. And it exhibited a strange sense of fearlessness because many animals out in the wilderness are afraid of us, but this wasn't. In fact, he got the impression that what he was looking at was an alpha predator. And then he noted that within seconds of this thing standing there out on the trail looking at him, it was beginning to size him up, considering him a potential threat. And he noted that it kept looking down at his hand where his shotgun was because he was holding it on his side. And that made him incredibly nervous because then he described that he was pretty sure this thing knew what a shotgun was, or it at least knew that what he had on him, what he was holding was a weapon, which is why it was now sizing him up. Now, his description of it was actually very similar to the last eyewitness with very large head, broad shoulders, very long, lanky limbs, and mentioned that its hands were very similar to that of a raccoon, just much larger with about two to three inch claws on each finger. He described its fur as pitch black, very unkempt looking, and that in his words, it looked evil. He then goes on to describe that this thing actually scowled at him, turned to its left, and actually leapt about 15 to 20 feet in the air up into the trees. Now that spooked him like none other. He turns around and he leaves. He does not continue on. And as he's running back to his vehicle, there's actually a very young couple who are coming up the same trail that he was just at, going the way he just came from. And he stops them and explains, you guys cannot go any further. There is a very large, I don't even know what, up the trail. It could be very dangerous. The couple just stared at him blankly and laughed at him, thinking he was off his rocker and they just continued on their way, ignoring his warning. He's not exactly sure whatever became of the couple, and he assumes that they're okay and were not eaten, but he is not going back on that trailhead no matter how much money you offer him, and he swears that what he saw was not anything that was natural or native to the state of Tennessee. Back in 2010, my cousins and I used to live in a small town in Blount County, Tennessee. Our house was right on the edge of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. It was a hot August night, just a few days after my 11th birthday. I was in my room playing Mario Kart on my Nintendo DS when my cousin walks in and asks if I can help him take the trash out before it gets too dark. I agree, pause my game, and we head out to the backyard. The trash cans were located at the far end of our property. 
near the tree line that marked the beginning of the park. We had a big yard, so it was a bit of a walk. As we were walking back after dumping the trash, we heard a strange noise coming from the woods. It was a low growl, unlike anything we had heard before. We brushed it off as probably a raccoon or some other small animal. We continued walking, but the noise grew louder and more bizarre. It was then that we saw it. Perched on a tree branch, just a few feet away from us, was a large, dark figure. It was too big to be a bird, and it had a human-like shape. It had wings, like a bat, but they were huge. The figure was just sitting there, watching us. We were frozen in fear, not knowing what to do. We ran back to the house as fast as we could, locking all the doors and windows. We told our parents about what we saw, but they just laughed it off, saying it was probably just a large owl or something. But we knew what we saw, and it was no owl. A few days later, a severe thunderstorm hit our town. It was the worst storm in Blount County's history. The storm caused a lot of damage and even took a few lives. It was a disaster. The strange part was, there were multiple reports of UFO sightings just before the storm hit. The Mutual UFO Network even recorded these sightings. Looking back, I can't help but wonder if the figure we saw that night was somehow related to the storm. Was it a warning of the disaster that was about to hit our town? I can't say for sure. All I know is that what we saw that night was not human. In 2008, we have an eyewitness of the name of Melissa. Now, she was just like any other ordinary young adult sitting in her rural Tennessee home watching TV late at night, relaxing, just enjoying the peace and quiet. She could hear the crickets outside. Everything was as it should be. But as she's engrossed in her movie, she gets that strange, all too familiar tingling sensation that not just something isn't right, but that someone's looking at her. And so she lives alone. She's all by herself. She quickly pauses the movie. She stands up. She's looking around. And as she's looking, her eye catches something over by the far window near the kitchen. She can't exactly tell what it is, but she could see that there's a large shape and immediately her stomach is churning. She's thinking there might be an intruder. So she runs over to the window, braver than any of us guys, I can only imagine. And as she gets close to the window, she's horrified by what she sees. Now, there's several things wrong. The first is that the shadow wasn't exactly outside the window, but actually by the edge of the roof hanging down. And she can also now kind of begin to see the details. Something... She described it as something, not someone or an animal, but something is actually slightly hanging off the roof and pulling its way up. Immediately she screams, she picks up the phone, calls 911. Within 10 minutes, they have a sheriff's deputy out there looking around. He can't find anything, but he notices strange three-toed tracks that lead out from the bog or the swamp or whatever it is that she described all the way up to the side of her house. And then he found these strange, almost claw paw print like tracks going up the side of her house and on the roof. She has no way to describe what it was. She's absolutely terrified by this. And so the following day, she actually goes and spends the night at a friend's house because she's so petrified by what had transpired the night before. After a day or so, she decides to return back home, assuming that everything is going to be all right. And the same night that she's making her way back home, something happens all throughout her house at once, everything just goes off. It's as if the fuse box has completely blown and she begins to describe this strange static electricity feeling in the house from all around. And then it gets so strong, she begins to feel physically ill and near the point of vomiting. That's when she recalls blacking out or the moment leading up to blacking out and then waking up on her floor the following morning. Going outside the next day, she notices those same weird clawed muddy prints along the side of her house like something was actually walking up her walls that looked 
bipedal, she described. Now, she never said how big the prints were or what they looked like, but just that there was no way to explain any animal physically walking up the side of her house, going up onto the roof. Within a few days, she actually calls up a good friend of hers, a good family friend, who's actually a Southern Baptist. He comes out there, he checks the place out, and he tells her, I think there's something wrong with this house. There's things here that just don't feel right. So he prays for protection over the whole place. He sprinkles the doorways with holy water and also does salt. He wishes her well. He's on his way. For the next couple weeks, nothing happens. Everything is calm. Everything is quiet. And then about three or so weeks after, she describes the worst event that would happen. Once again, she's at home all by herself. Late at night, she's watching TV because that was one of her favorite things to do to just kind of de stress from the day and it's probably about midnight maybe 12 30 she's kind of a night owl and her neighbor or the closest neighbor she has has quite a few cattle and so they're roughly maybe a quarter mile away from her house and all of a sudden roughly around 12 12 30 at night she hears the most horrific not one but multiple of these cattle what she would describe as screaming in pain now, it was the most horrific sound she had ever described, and then it actually caused her to coil up out of fear for not knowing what it was in that moment, although the following day she would actually learn it was the cattle, but we'll get to that. Accompanying these poor cattle's scream and cries, she hears the most horrific screeching and disgusting animal sounds and gurgling. She can't even begin to describe it. Whatever it was had made her so terrified, she stayed up almost all night night to the break of dawn. The following day comes, or whenever she wakes up, probably around noon because she was exhausted, her neighbor, who she was relatively close with, is knocking at her door, asking her if she knew what was going on. She describes that she doesn't know what's going on, she's not sure what had happened, but she then tells him what she had heard the night previously. And of course, he's pale-faced, he's sick to his stomach, these were his cattle, or at least a few of them, and he goes into detail that these things were ripped to shreds, not just clawed into, not just eaten, but literally ripped to pieces that there was barely anything left to even identify them as cattle. The only thing that they could discern was the leftovers of a cattle was the head, but that its tongue, teeth, teeth, yes, teeth, weird as that is, and eyes were completely missing, but everything else was just a bloody, nasty mess. Now, this is an older gentleman, and he was adamant that this wasn't the work of coyotes, this wasn't the work of black bears, this was something far beyond his comprehension. He has no idea what was going on. So then, of course, the police get involved. They look around both pieces of property. They can't find anything that would give them any answers or allude to what it could have been, and so the PD is scratching their heads. They don't know what to think of it. They just think it's probably a pack of coyotes or something, even though this older gentleman is adamant that this wasn't a pack of coyotes that did this to his three cattle. And it was at this point that Melissa did not feel safe living where she lived anymore and very quickly put her house on the market and in the meantime moved in with one of her close friends. She never went into the specifics of exactly where this was in rural Tennessee, but just that she will never go back to this area. And even driving down these long back roads terrifies her because she believes there's something there, something that she can't begin to understand. Now, it's also important to note, she never went into the description of what she saw. She never described it being anything other than what we know from the story. So it's hard to say, but it definitely has an air of mystery to it, and it's certainly creepy. I had a bizarre experience back in 2005, long before I had any knowledge of the Mothman. It wasn't until years later, after watching the movie The Mothman Prophecies and reading the book, that I connected the dots. I had completely forgotten about my encounter until then. It was a hot summer night in August. I had been hanging out at a friend's house in Nashville, Tennessee. Around 3 a.m., I decided to head home. The heat was unbearable, even at that hour. As I reached the end of the neighborhood, I noticed a figure in the distance. It was moving from one side of the road to the other, in a strange, jerky motion. It was incredibly thin, almost skeletal, and it moved with an urgency that was unsettling. It looked like it was running from something, or maybe to something. I couldn't tell. As I got closer, 
the figure darted into a nearby yard and came to a sudden stop at the corner of a house. It was a strange sight. The figure was grayish at the bottom and dark at the top, blending perfectly with the house's siding and shutters. I slowed down my car, squinting to get a better look. The figure was tall, taller than any human I'd ever seen. It had long, thin arms that hung down to its knees and a head that was disproportionately small for its body. It was standing perfectly still, as if it was trying to blend in with the house. I was about to drive off when I noticed its eyes. They were glowing, a bright, intense red that seemed to pierce the darkness. I was scared, but I couldn't look away. I felt a strange connection to this creature, like it was trying to communicate with me. I sat there for what felt like hours, staring into those glowing red eyes. I wanted to drive away, to get as far away from this creature as possible, but I couldn't. I was frozen in place, my hands gripping the steering wheel so tightly that my knuckles turned white. Suddenly, the creature moved. It turned its head slowly, looking directly at me. I could see its eyes clearly now. They were large and round, with a strange, milky white color. It was like looking into the eyes of a dead man. I knew I had to get out of there. I slammed my foot on the gas pedal and sped off, leaving the creature behind. I didn't look back. I didn't want to see if it was following me. I just wanted to get home, to get to safety. I drove as fast as I could, my heart pounding in my chest. I didn't stop until I reached my driveway. I never saw the creature again, but the memory of that night has stayed with me. Now, the very last story that I have to share, specifically from Tennessee, is not very long, but it's from an older gentleman who shared that years back, he used to live in a small piece of property with some horses and some other livestock right outside of Townsend. Now, for any of you who live in Tennessee, you're probably familiar with the geography of Tennessee and where these towns are, but he described it as very rural and a perfect place to have livestock and animals and dogs and cats and whatever you want to have, go for it. But that all changed one evening when he said his mare was acting very, very strange and that he couldn't understand why she was acting so skittish and freaked. And this was a mare of his that he was very bonded to. He knew her like the back of his hand. He knew her mannerisms and when she was afraid and when she was happy. So he was very connected with this horse. And so this one particular day, she was just acting off and he didn't know why. So the evening came and he noticed that this particular time of day, she was being extremely reclusive. So he tried not to think too much of it, went ahead, went to bed, got up the following morning to find one of the most horrific things that he's ever encountered. Now you're probably imagining that he's gonna go out there and find the horse stripped to pieces, but that's not exactly what happened. Actually, he couldn't find the horse anywhere. He checked the stables, assuming that she had got out. He's looking all over the property. He can't find her. And so he's spending the majority of the day looking all around his property when he decides the only place he hasn't looked is the back portion of his property, which is just very thick, dense woods. Now, he mentioned that the woods were so dense with all the shrubbery and foliage that it's very unlikely she would have wandered back there. For whatever reason, she always acted skittish around that area, and so it didn't really make a lot of sense to check back there. But he was like, you know what, maybe I'll just go check anyway because I'm desperate. Well, as it turns out, that not even 50 feet in, up in a tree, about 25 feet up, he finds his horse dead with its head and right front leg completely missing. He described that it looked like something had grabbed the horse's head and had twisted it off its body. Once they were able to get the horse down, which I don't even know how you do that. He didn't describe it. He just described that once the horse was down and they were looking at the body and trying to figure out what happened, that the flesh around the base of the neck was torn and twisted, which is how we understood it as something had twisted the head off and that the leg, the front right leg had the same trauma to it, the same kind of injury. He never went into detail about the kind of tree it was in or how thick branches would be because you think how heavy a horse is 
And if you're talking 20 to 25 feet up, well, in my head, the branches can't be that thick. So there's either sturdy enough branches or there was enough branches to hold the body of the horse. See, that's the thing with these stories is you're not always given every single minute detail. So you kind of have to assume and fill in the blanks on some of these things. So that's what I'm assuming happened and how it happened. But he described that after that day, after finding his horse, he kept smelling this awful, skunky, pungent odor all around his property, but he never saw anything. He never sensed anything. He didn't lose any more of his livestock. And if it was a pack of coyotes or something that would take his horse, why wouldn't it take his chickens? I mean, the man had over 20 free range chickens all over his property. Nothing ever happened. He had cats and dogs. Nothing ever happened. He had goats. So it's hard to say exactly what or why. Why did it pick the mare? Who knows? And what exactly was it? It really just makes you wonder that is there truly an alpha predator hiding in the thick wilderness of Tennessee? This happened in the early fall of 2013 in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. The sky was clear with a bright moon, if my memory serves me right. It was just after dusk. My cousin and I were strolling through a park on the outskirts of the town. As we were walking down the main path through the park, something came sprinting from the entrance and dashed past us on our right. My cousin chuckled and asked if I had heard that, and I halted in my tracks and replied that no, but I had seen it. As the thing had darted between trees, I caught a glimpse. It looked like a human, but it was too tall and thin to be a normal person. It was a strange sight, almost like a skeleton, but it was covered in a pale white skin. I would guess it was about eight feet tall. It moved with an unnatural speed, disappearing into the woods before we could get a good look. We were both a little shaken, but we decided to continue our walk, thinking it might have been a trick of the light or our imaginations. As we walked further into the park, we heard rustling in the bushes to our left. We stopped to listen, and the rustling stopped. We started walking again, and the rustling started again. It was bizarre, like whatever was in the bushes was following us. We decided to turn back and head towards the car. As we were walking back, we heard a loud crash behind us. We turned around and saw a large figure standing between two trees. It was the same figure we had seen earlier. It was standing there watching us. We were both terrified and ran back to the car. We drove away as fast as we could, but we couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. We didn't talk about what happened for a long time. It was too strange, too bizarre to put into words. We both knew what we saw, but we couldn't explain it. It wasn't a person. It wasn't an animal. It was something else. Something we couldn't understand. We never went back to that park. We couldn't. Every time we thought about it, we would remember that figure, standing between the trees, watching us. It was a strange experience, one that we will never forget. That's what happened. That's what we saw. We can't explain it, but we know it was real. Sometimes, that's all you can say. Now that you guys have made it this far into the video, I want you to all comment down below, Tennessee is a hairy place. Do it, seriously. It's hilarious because people think that there's just tons of bots posting these comments and I laugh so hard every time I see it. So if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button. I love you all, keep it open mind, and I'll catch you all in the very next episode.